My dearly beloved in Christ, the important feast of Corpus Christi was established in the year 1264 to be celebrated every year on the Thursday after Trinity Sunday. For many centuries, there was not a distinct feast of the Holy Eucharist in the church year. We, of course, honor the institution of the Holy Eucharist every year on Holy Thursday, but necessarily our attention is taken up with the approaching passion of our Lord. And so we cannot give to the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist the emphasis and the honor that are due. And so there was need of another feast simply in honor of the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. And this feast came about in a very interesting way. The story is related by Father Michael Mueller in his wonderful book, The Blessed Eucharist, Our Greatest Treasure. If you have never read this book, I highly recommend it. Or if it has been many years, it would be good to reread this wonderful book on the Holy Eucharist. Well, Father Michael Mueller says that there was a nun in Belgium named Sister Juliana. And she kept being disturbed in her prayers by seeing a disc like the moon, like a full moon, a bright disc, but there was part of it missing or obscured. And she couldn't figure out what this meant, and it wouldn't go away. It kept coming to her. And she would pray and try and concentrate on her prayers, and she kept seeing this vision. And finally, our Lord himself made known to her what was indicated by this vision. He said, the disc is the liturgical year by which we celebrate the feast days of Christmas and Easter and all of the feast days throughout the year. We celebrate them every year, like a cycle symbolized by the disc. But there is one, he said, that is missing, a distinct feast in honor of the Holy Eucharist. And he said to Sister Juliana, and it is my will that a feast in honor of the Holy Eucharist, be established in the church, and I want you to go to your superiors and see that this be accomplished. Now, she was petrified at the thought, a nun, a cloistered nun, what is she going to do? And for many years, even, she did not make this known to her superiors. She was too afraid to do so and felt so unworthy. And finally, She mentioned it to her superior, and then the word was taken to a priest who was a theologian and a very pious priest, and I believe he lived at the cathedral, and that was where he was stationed. And he saw the value, the importance of a feast in honor of the Holy Eucharist, so he promoted this idea. But there were other priests and theologians who thought, no, we have Mass every day, why do we need a separate feast of the Holy Eucharist? Well, by God's providence, that priest rose through the ranks of the clergy and ended up becoming the Pope, Pope Urban IV. And so he instituted, again in 1264, the Feast of Corpus Christi. And he commissioned St. Thomas Aquinas to write the office and mass for that feast. Now, when I say to write the mass, what that means is to gather together the various quotations from scripture pertaining to the Eucharist that would be appropriate and to compile them, to arrange them for the proper of the Mass, to choose the Gospel, the Epistle, and especially with the office, to write the antiphones, to determine which psalms will be used at matins and so forth. And St. Thomas wrote the hymns, or poems we might call them, that are recited in the Divine Office. He composed five of them, And they are magnificent. Let me read to you a little bit about these poems, which I want to read at least one of them. Five hymns were composed by the great Eucharistic, uh, the great Eucharistic hymns composed by St. Thomas Aquinas, who lived from 1227 to 1274. They were written at the request of Pope Urban IV on the occasion of the institution of the Feast of Corpus Christi in 1264. The hymns of the angelic doctor are remarkable for their smoothness and clearness and for their logical conciseness and dogmatic precision. 
They are pervaded throughout by a spirit of the profoundest piety, so characteristic of the angel of the schools. It is fitting that a great doctor of the church and a great saint should have confined his hymn writing to a single subject, and that sweetest and profoundest of all subjects, the most holy sacrament of the altar. So in other words, St. Thomas, even though he had all this talent, did not write poems about any other subject, but only the Holy Eucharist. We use his poem, Pange Lingua, at Vespers. We also use it when we have a procession of the Blessed Sacrament. The last two verses of the Pange Lingua are Tantumergo, begin with Tantumergo, and are used at benediction. At Matins, we have the hymn Sacri Solemniis. The last two stanzas of that hymn begin with Panis Angelicus and are frequently sung, set to music. At Lauds, the hymn of the Divine Office is Verbum Supernum Proteans, the last two stanzas of which begin with the words O Salutaris Hostia, and also are used at benediction. He also wrote what is called the Lauda Sion Salvatorum, which is the sequence for the Mass of Corpus Christi in between the Epistle and Gospel. And the fifth and final hymn he wrote is my favorite, it is called Adoro Te Devote. Uh, an English translation of that begins, Godhead here in hiding, whom I do adore, etc. These beautiful hymns are not only they flow beautifully in Latin, but they also express the doctrine of the Holy Eucharist, that our Lord is present, body, blood, soul, and divinity under the appearances of bread and wine, and that he is whole and entire, under both the species of bread and the species of wine. And these hymns go on to give many little theological aspects of the doctrine of the Holy Eucharist. So again, they are wonderful hymns, and I would like to read just a, a, a translation of one of them, the Adoro Te Devote. I devoutly adore thee, O hidden deity, who truly lies hidden under these figures. My whole heart subjects itself to thee, for it finds itself wholly lost in contemplating thee. Sight, touch, and taste are each deceived in thee, but by hearing only can we safely believe. I believe whatever the Son of God has said. Nothing can be more true than the word of him who is the truth. On the cross was hidden thy divinity alone, but here thy humanity also lies concealed. Nevertheless, believing and confessing both, I pray for what the penitent thief did pray. The wounds I do not see as Thomas did, yet do I confess thee to be my God. Make me ever more and more believe in thee, put my hope in thee, and love thee. O memorial of the Lord's death, O living bread that givest life to man, grant to my soul ever to live in thee, and that thou mayest ever taste sweet to it. O loving pelican, Jesus Lord, cleanse me who am unclean in thy blood, one drop of which has power to save the whole world from all its sin. O Jesus, thou whom veiled I now behold, I beseech thee that what I so thirst for may happen, that beholding thee with thy countenance unveiled, I may be happy in the vision of thy glory. And as I said, each of these hymns brings out so beautifully various aspects of our faith regarding the presence of our Lord. I like the way St. Thomas here says, on the cross, the divin divinity of our Lord lay hid. But here in the Hol Holy Eucharist, even his humanity is hidden. We see him under the appearances of bread and wine, but we truly believe that that is our divine Lord. So let us give thanks for this wonderful gift of the Holy Eucharist today. The gospel that is read for the second Sunday after Pentecost is a parable of our Lord about a rich man who prepared a great banquet. And he invited all of his friends and all of the nobility but they all began to make excuses. And many did not come. And it says he was angry. 
And he sent his servant out and told the servant, bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And that was done and there was still room. And then the wealthy man said to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in so that my hall may be filled. And our Lord truly has prepared for us a banquet, a spiritual banquet for the nourishment of the soul. And many have chosen to reject it. And we are like the poor and the blind and the lame. And we are invited to come and taste of that banquet. And as our Lord says in the gospel for Corpus Christi, your fathers in the desert ate the manna, but they have died. The bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. And he who eats this bread and drinks the cup of the Lord, drinks of my blood, will have life everlasting and I will abide in him. But St. Paul warns us that he who drinks, he who eats of this bread unworthily or drinks of the cup unworthily will be guilty of the body and the blood of our Lord. So let us prepare always well for Holy Communion. And never remain away from communion out of a sense of unworthiness. Because after all, who is worthy to receive Holy Communion? But we do our best. We make certain we are in the state of grace and never approach the Holy Communion rail without the state of sanctifying grace and the proper fast and the proper intention. And to do our part, to prepare well, to receive our Lord for this bread of life is truly the life of the soul. Without it, we would die spiritually. Let us often receive our Lord, but always worthily, as devoutly as possible, and to also make a devout thanksgiving, because we could never thank him enough for this wonderful gift of his own body and blood in the Holy Eucharist. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.